Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started now. Nadia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. I'm gonna turn you up a little bit on my side so everybody else can hear you. Perfect. Maybe. <laughs> Can you just say hi again really quick? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hello, good morning. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm Sherry Richards. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at SPAR. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Nadia is going to be joining us for the 2023 forecast. And uh, she's going to speak to the trends of the current real estate market, what to expect for the rest of this year, and what the predictions are for 23. Nadia will provide trends and statistics for our local metro area and the state of Minnesota. Nadia is a senior economist and director of forecasting at the National Association of Realtors. While all real estate is local, she focuses on regional and local market trends, including the effects of changing demographic and migration patterns to forecast housing activity. Nadia has been involved in research and analysis about local housing affordability conditions and local solutions to increase housing inventory. She also studies the effects of federal policies on the real estate market. Nadia holds her master's degree in applied economics from John Hopkins University, as well as advanced degrees in international European economics and public administration. Nadia, I also believe that I saw you were awarded the 2022 Rising Stars Award from Housing Wire. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, yeah, for the great introduction. Like, good morning, everyone. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank you for having me like here today and give me the opportunity to uh, discuss with you about the latest market trends like nationwide and specifically I will try to uh, be more specific like for the twin cities um actually like today morning like just a few like minutes ago Freddie Mac released uh, the today's like mortgage rates and actually what we see is that rates continue to uh, move upwards and they hit like 6% for the first time like after so long. So um, what we see, we see that uh, rates are about like 3% at points higher than a year ago. But how much higher will go? Are they going to go like to 7%? And how are these rates going to affect like home buyers and the market like in the upcoming month? So these are some of the questions that we will try to to respond like today like but before discussing like these topics um let's first take a look at some i think like very important like economic indicators like that will help us like understand uh, better the market so i will start sharing my screen uh just bear with me a little bit um and i think you're able to see it. yes right Perfect. Yes, we can. So speak. yeah. Uh, so let's start first with the labor market. Um, it's remarkable to see uh, these like stroke job gains that we had. Like uh, specifically, the economy was able to recover all the jo jobs that were lost in the beginning of the pandemic. Actually, there are like more jobs now than back in March 2020 when the pandemic hit our country. Specifically, there are about like 1.7 million more jobs now as of August, we have the latest data, than in March of 2020. Um, in the meantime, unemployment rate is near a record loss, like below 4%, which indicates like how strong the labor market is since it shows how many people who want a job and are available for work and find a job. In fact, there are like two jobs uh, for every unemployed person. Thus, the job market uh, recovery after uh, the pandemic has been like remarkable rapid compared to other notable like recoveries uh, in recent history. But then when we take a look um, at the job creation by area, we see that there's substantial variations uh, in job growth like across the country. Uh, for instance, as you can see here in the map, Utah and Idaho are the two states with the fastest uh, employment growth across the country. Actually, 
uh, it's very promising to see that more and more states are joining the list with job um, gains, such as like Montana, Florida, uh, Texas, Georgia, and the Carolinas. So uh, when we take a look at the map, like in, in the states with blue color, not only the economy was able to recover the jobs that were lost uh, due to the pandemic, but there are actually more jobs now uh, than then, like in March 2020. So for, for example, like in both Utah and Idaho, there are more, uh, uh, more than 6% like more jobs now. This is very good news like for all these areas. And why is this important? Like, or otherwise what a strong job like growth means for the real estate market. Um, have in mind that as more uh, people enter back into workplace, demand for housing is expected to remain strong as they set their sites into home ownership. Uh, and what we see in Minnesota, in Minnesota, we see that we haven't recovered yet all the jobs. Um, when we compare the number of jobs in, um, in July, because this is the, the latest like local data that we have, uh, with the jobs back in March 2020, we have about like 1.4 percent like fewer jobs than then. Uh, specifically in um, the Minneapolis San Paul metro area, like in the Twin Cities, we we see that uh, the same trend. Uh, we also see, uh, miss about like thirty two thousand like jobs in order to be back to the pre pandemic level. Thus, although we don't have yet the number of jobs that we had like back then, it's promising to, to see that we are almost there. Uh, and we will probably recover those jobs, and we'll have even more jobs in the next like uh, following like. Uh, uh, three, uh, four like months. That's by the end like of the year probably. So this is what we expect for uh, the area. Um, then let's talk a little bit about inflation, which is one of the main like drivers uh, of the economy and the housing market. What do we see? Uh, new inflation like numbers released earlier this week, uh, and the data was disappointing. Uh, inflation uh, in August like rose faster than expected by like 8.3%. Um, although prices eased slightly uh, in August, inflation, what we see is that inflation continued to rise like very fast. Uh, it's not of course the 9.1 or the 8.5 that we had like in the previous, like in the past two months, um, but this number is higher than what we expected, like given the retreat that we, we, um, we noticed like in the gasoline like prices. Uh, and a significant contributor like to inflation was the rapidly like rising rents, which rose about like 7% from a year ago, uh, which is the fastest like growth uh, in nearly like 40 years in the last like four decades. And rent prices will continue to accelerate like in the near term. This is what we expect as rental demand remains like exceptionally uh, high from the ongoing like job additions and the higher like mortgage rates that force like people out of the home buying like market since they cannot afford to buy a home, they, we see some of them, they uh, choose to continue to, to rent. So to answer the question like of what to expect from inflation in the following months, I will say that there is a sustained like decline in, uh, if, the, if there is a sustainable like decline in gasoline prices and more production like of apartments, and single family homes, consumer prices will pull back. Um, thus, this deceleration could help the Federal Reserve to reduce the inflation to be closer to its like 2% target that we would want to have. However, consumers should have in mind that prices will continue to increase, but at a slower play, pace. It's not that prices will stop increasing, it's about the pace of the increase which will likely continue to be slower in the months ahead. Also, and we have multiple times like I mentioned that uh, it takes like several months like to achieve, and it will take like several months uh, uh, for the Fed to achieve uh, the 2% like uh, target or to slow down the inflation. Uh, according to, to the Federal Reserve, like inflation um, will likely be about like 5% by year end. So um, uh, this is one of the indicators of inflation that like we watch closely since it affects like um, the market and the, the housing market. Um, as a result, um, mortgage rates of the increase like inflation, mortgage rates continue to escalate 
And as I mentioned like before today, they passed like the 6%. It's like actually 6.02%. Um, and actually they surpassed, like mortgage rates surpassed their uh, recent high that they had like in mid-June. Um, and have in mind that there are three factors mainly affect like today's market, like expectations on inflation, uh, expectations on economic growth, and the expectations um, for the Fed's like next rate hike, which is gonna be like next week. Um, so, and let me explain a little bit, like inflation, how these factors affect like uh, the mortgage rates. So inflation and high interest rates typically move up yields as investors like demand a higher return for, for example, for the inflation, for the inflation like risk that they will have. Um, nevertheless, concerns about slow economic growth can put a hold uh, like on the pace of the increase. Uh, in the meantime, what we see, like the bond market is showing signs that there are like persistent fears about the economy. Uh, actually, what we see is that the shorter term bonds, such as like the two year uh, yields, like continue to have a higher yield than the longer term like ones, even though they have like lower risk, like usually the short term uh, bonds, they have like a lower yield than the longer term because uh, the short term have like a lower risk than the long term. That's, um, so, uh, but when we have the opposite, this shows that uh, investors are concerned about the economy. So we have an inversion of uh, the yields of the curve. That's, uh, after this, uh, these three factors, I expect like mortgage rates to hover about like, they pass the 6%, but to hover about like 6%, close to the 6% and 5.9% like in October. And then uh, then about like to remain close to the 6% for the remainder of the year. So, because of course we understand that inflation uh, makes like mortgage rates to um, increase, but again, there are like these concerns about how the economy will handle like the next rate hike and there are fears about the, uh, the, the state of the economy after all these like rate hikes from the Fed. But rates are still historically low and we need to remind everybody that the historical average 30 year fixed mortgage rate is 8%. So now we're at the 6%, of course. Um, uh, however, like rates are significantly like higher than the previous year and about like uh, three percentage points and more than three percentage points. Um, as a result, uh, the monthly mortgage payment is about like 60% higher compared to last year. So specifically, I included here in the slide uh, how much like the monthly payment changed like in, twin, in the twin cities like uh, in the last year. Uh, we see that the monthly mortgage payment was about like is about like 2,100, the median priced home in the area. And a year earlier was about like 1400. So we have about like the, uh, this means that the current buyers need to pay about like $700 like more every month compared to those who purchased the home like a year ago. Um, and while like borrowing costs like have increased um, faster than people wages, because with this is what we see, wages cannot keep up like with the inflation, uh, with the rate of the inflation, we see that the buyers um, and the rate of, uh, uh, we see that buyers could currently need to spend like 10% more of their budget of their mortgage payment uh, if they want, um, for the mortgage payment, uh, if they want to buy the medium priced home. However, not all of them can do that. They cannot stretch like uh, their budget because it, there are already like cost burdens. So we see that about 280,000 like, households have been priced out in the area in the Twin Cities compared to a year ago. So this means that these households were able to afford to buy the medium priced home in the area last year, but they cannot do it like anymore. They cannot afford to buy the typical uh, home in the area. Um, so with these rates and home prices like hurting affordability and making even more difficult for some buyers to afford to buy a home, we see that housing market is slowing down like in 2022. And actually this is a good thing. Like this is what we, we wanted to see a healthier and a more predictable real estate market. Have in mind that 2021 was the best year for the housing market in the last 15 years, like since 2006. Uh, and home purchase like surge over the 
uh, the past year in an abnormal way, like even though home prices hit record highs, eroding affordability, housing market lack outperform. That nationwide home sales will continue to slow down, uh, but maybe to stabilize as rates may also rise at a slower pace. We see it to be like uh, close to the 6%. Uh, in fact, uh, home sales dropped for the last like for the last uh, six straight months, uh, and this is also considered as the start of a recession. So uh, recession when we have uh, for the housing market when we have for six straight months um, a slowdown, uh, declining um, home sales activity. This uh, shows that uh, the market goes to uh, enters like a recession. However, I would like to point out that this is a slowdown in the home sales but not a uh, recession home prices uh, in the contrary home prices and uh, i will uh, i will um uh, talk a little like further about that in the, in my next slide uh, about prices we see that they continue to increase very fast uh, like a uh, still double digit like appreciation thus for 2022 we expect like home sales to drop about like 13 percent compared to last year as demand like will cool down but have in mind, of course, like last year, we had like about 6.1 million uh, homes that they were sold. So we had um, overperformed like uh, in the housing market. And to give you an idea, like we expect about 5.3 uh, million homes to be sold in 2022. So um, let's see what's going on uh, with the home prices. Um, although this high year, mortgage rates like herd affordability, we see that home prices continue to rise. Like normally when, when we expect like uh, we expect a higher mortgage rates to cool off prices, but actually I don't expect like uh, uh, home prices to drop in 2022. We will see a slower home price appreciation, but not the price drop. Like in fact, data shows that home prices rose 11% in July, although mortgage rates like were rising then. Uh, and then, so we, we have an acceleration, we have like, a, because uh, back in like um, May, for example, home prices were rising about like 14%. However, we see an acceleration about like 11%, but we don't expect to have like a price drop. And actually looking back in history, because this is what we do uh, many times, we, we want to see uh, what we can learn from uh, like uh, past times, we see that home prices didn't fall when mortgage rates like, and inflation were also rising, like back in 1979. And neither, like for example, in 1982, like when mortgage rates reached like 18%, <clears throat> specifically home prices rose about 5% on average between 1980 and 1982. Um, in the meantime, we should bear in mind that mortgage rates and inflation were much higher then in the 80s than they are now. Uh, nevertheless, like mortgage rates are currently like as we mentioned, like historically low, <coughs> as are like um, below the 8%. Um, meanwhile, I expect the impact of this rise in mortgage rates to uh, be even smaller than back in the 80s, as there is also a severe housing shortage. Like when there is a housing shortage, prices don't drop. Like we, um, so for that reason, we expect like housing, uh, home prices to uh, increase about like 12% in 2022, so still to have a double digit like appreciation. But, <coughs> excuse me, but we hear again and again that home prices hurt affordability significantly. Indeed, like the medium priced home is worth about like 40,000 like more than a year earlier. Mm -hmm. But while both home prices and mortgage rates increase the borrowing cost for prospective like buyers, the impact of higher mortgage rates is about like three times larger on the monthly mortgage payment than that of the home prices. Specifically, within the last uh, 12 months, the, the last year, when everything else is equal, <clears throat> the monthly mortgage payment, uh, what we see, uh, uh, the monthly mortgage payment rose about like $510 due to the increase in mortgage rates. However, hi uh, higher home prices pushed up the mortgage rate by $150. So it seems that again, 500 and the home prices increase, increase like the monthly payment about like 150. So it seems that 1% that's when rates increase like by 1% that's point, 
have the same impact on the mortgage rates as if like home prices rise 13%. However, as you mentioned, like in the last year, mortgage rates have increased about like three percentage points. So, but home prices didn't, uh, they, they increased like, as we mentioned, like 11% and not like uh, three times like more. So, so we see uh, that demand is slowing down uh, due to this uh, higher rates since we have like a fewer home sales. However, housing demand, what we expect is that it will remain relatively strong and this is due to favorable demographics. But what are the demographics? Like demographics are, are the data that describes like the composition of a population such as like age, race, uh, gender, income, migration patterns and population like growth. So these statistics uh, mostly affect like how uh, real estate is priced and what types of properties are in demand. And major shifts like in demographics of a nation um, can have like a large like impact uh, of real estate like trends for several decades. Uh, so what we see is like, <coughs> first of all, many millennials will reach the family life, which means that they will turn like 30 in the next five uh, years, about 10 million like millennials. And this is um, about like one in three millions. They represent the 30% almost of the millennials. And as a major life event, uh, marriage often uh, coincides with the household's decision to expand housing and obtain like home ownership. As, as you see here, like in the chart, uh, the home ownership rate is about like 50% um, above the age of 33, which means that the majority of uh, households who are like 33 years old, um, they own their own like home. And then at the age like 37, the home ownership rate like exceeds, the, uh, uh, is about like 60%. Thus, demand is expected to remain like strong in the following years, as many of them will look like for a home. Uh, in addition, uh, the baby boomers are like people who were born between 1945 and 1964 are an, another like example of demographic like trend with the potential to significantly like influence the real estate market. It's actually the transition like of these baby boomers to retirement one of the most like interesting like generation trends in the last century in the retirement of these baby boomers which began like in 2010 is bound to be noticed like in the market uh, for decades to come um, and actually there are like numerous like ways this type of demographic like shift can affect uh, the real estate market for example how how they will affect the demand for second homes in the popular vacation areas as more like people start to retire or how will this affect, um, this trend will affect the demand for larger homes if incomes are smaller, because usually when you get retired, you have a smaller like income and children have already moved out. So based on the data, uh, the number of households aged 65 and older increased about like 40%, like 38 percentage points during 2010 and 2020. Um, in contrast, like households aged below 65 rose by just one percentage point so about like 40 percent for senior household compared to only like uh, one percentage points for younger like uh, below like 65 years old meanwhile in less than a decade the year 2000 uh, 2030 like 2030 uh, will mark a demographic turning point like for the u.s uh, by then all baby boomers will be older than 65, like boosting even further like the number of older adults. But of course, demographics vary by area and often very significantly that some areas are expected to experience like aging at faster like pace than other areas. And using the US sessions data, it's, it's interesting to see that the older adult population is rising in the, even faster in the Minneapolis Sun Paul uh, metro area in the Twin Cities. Like the number of senior households rose uh, by about like 46%, so close to 50%, compared to 4% for younger like households. That's 
uh, and is above like the national level as, as well. Like it was about 38. However, like in the Twin Cities, like older uh, senior households rose about like 46%. Um, another factor that boosted like housing demand and will continue we think to do that like is teleworking like two years into the pandemic, three years old. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, two years into the pandemic and the majority of workers with uh, with jobs that can be done like from home are still like teleworking. Like in the meantime, uh, it's interesting to see that millennials or young professionals are the ones that resist more. Like about, I came across with a study and it showed that about like 71% of um, uh, 18 to 24 years old said that they wouldn't consider like looking for another job if their company insisted on them like returning back to the office full time. And when we take a look, so it was 71% and this uh, share drops to 61% for ages 35 to 44 years old and about like 56% for ages uh, 45 to 54. But how teleworking is affecting the real estate market? So with teleworking like reaching all time highs like during the pandemic, we saw many people living from big city centers and moving to suburbs and smaller cities. Like while people move for various reasons, uh, some of them were looking like for bigger houses uh, with bigger like yards uh, for the kids to play and like office spaces for them to, to work. Others uh, were looking like for more affordable houses homes uh, in less dense areas like away from large city centers since they can like telework. Indeed, according to our home buyers and sellers survey, the size of the purchase homes increased like in 2021 compared to 2019 compared to pre-pandemic. Thus, the pandemic has reshaped where we live with like workers no longer like expected to show up in person, at least not daily. We don't see that like many like uh, they choose to uh, to go like two or three times per week. We see that many like uh, they choose to leave um, uh, where they choose to live will continue like uh, to change as we see like a persistent. Uh, and this is what we see. We see a persistent urban rural uh, migration trend. So, but let's see how the Twin Cities will be benefited from these like demographics. Uh, first of all, the Twin Cities have a faster household formation than nationwide, specifically according to 2020 census data. The number of households grew up about like 11% in the area compared to 9% like nationwide uh, in the last decade, like between 2010 and 2020. So this translates to about 145, like almost like 150,000 more households in the last 10 years. Why is this important? Like for uh, the housing market, like population changes can lead to a changing demand like for housing. When population like rises, housing demand does too, while a declining population like leads to lower like housing demand. So we always watch like closely population changes when we want to predict like the housing market. Uh, in the meantime, people are more likely to own a home in, that, in the area than nationwide. Uh, or otherwise, the homeownership rate is higher than Twin Cities than nationwide. The rate is about like 7% uh, in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington uh, metro area, uh, compared to 65% at national level. Thus, expect even busier like activity in this area compared to the other areas like across the country. So we have high, high, uh, more households, um, uh, uh, to have more households uh, uh, and then to grow. And then many of them, we see like more of the national level, we see them like uh, to own a home. Um, then going one step further, uh, we see that the Twin Cities have a higher concentration of millennials than nationwide. 33% of the households in the area were born between 1980 and 1998. Like in the meantime, another statistic that draw my attention is that more millennials own a home in this area, like specifically about 56% of the millennial households own their own like home compared to 46% at national level. In the meantime, also have in mind that millennials um, 
are the largest like cohort of the home buyers, there's a higher population of this age group translates to an even busier like home buying activity in the area. And since uh, uh, millennials are more likely to uh, become uh, homeowners um, in this area, so this can also be tra translated to even even like busier like activity. Um, in the meantime, uh, overall, uh, twin cities are still like more affordable. So this is one of the reasons why we see like a higher homeownership rate in the area. So we see that uh, twin cities are still more affordable than most of the areas across the country. Like while uh, the median home price uh, in the area is lower than the national level, <coughs> we see that buyers can afford to buy a larger share of listings in uh, the Minneapolis and Paul Metro area than nationwide. But actually, uh, when we take a closer look at the data and we compare affordability by income level, when we go down like to the income level, we get that, in fact, twin cities are more affordable than nationwide for buyers who earn more than $100,000. So let's see uh, what like mid-income uh, buyers can afford to buy, uh, earning like about like $75,000 can afford to buy in the area versus nationwide. So I included here uh, a chart, like a table. Uh, and uh, what we see is in this table is that buyers earning about 75,000 can afford to buy about 15% of the listings in the Minneapolis and Paul Metro area compared to 23% like nationwide. So fewer listings than nationwide. However, buyers earning about 125,000 we see that they can afford to buy more listings than nationwide, like 54% compared to like 50%. So when we take a closer look at the data and the local affordability, we see that Twin Cities is more affordable than nationwide, especially like when we take a look in the upper income like uh, level, like buyers, income buyers. Um, in the meantime, apart from uh, affordability, we also need to think about availability of homes. Uh, inventory continues to be like near record lows, like pushing up home prices, making like the market competitive. We have like more inventory, but it's still like uh, the inventory is tight. Uh, and we have to have in mind like our country suffering like from severe like housing shortage. So let's now compare uh, the availability of homes uh, that buyers at different income levels can afford to buy now. Uh, in the beginning of the year, like when mortgage rates were like about like uh, three percent, that's like uh, about two two point eight like percent, that's like points like lower. What do we see? In a nutshell, we see that inventory is rising, which translates to more listings available in the market. However, it's uh, it's not worth it, uh, it's uh, it's worth noting to see that buyers in Twin Cities need to earn at least like $125,000 in order to afford to buy most of these additional homes. For example, again on the table, uh, in January 2022, there were about like 1,300 like homes available for sale for buyers earning $75,000. However, as of June 2022, there are fewer homes for this income level. Uh, there are like fewer than like 1,000 like listings. In contrast, like, uh, contrast um, for, for buyers earning $125,000, we see that there are about like six, 650 uh, more listings now compared to the beginning of the year, even though home buying like is more expensive, even though like their affordability like dropped. Thus, we see for these upper income buyers, there are more homes available for sale, even though like affordability is lower than in the beginning of the year for this income group. So although uh, it's very promising to, to see that inventory is rising, more entry level like homes need to be added to the market in order to, to help like more people to purchase a home and especially like first time home buyers if we wanna boost uh, the home ownership rate uh, in the area. But uh, let's now um, compare, let's go now and compare uh, the typical renter, what are the characteristics of the typical renter and the recent, with a, a recent buyer in order to get an idea of how many of the current renters in the Twin Cities will be able to make the transition 
from renters if like to home ownership. Uh, because this is what we all want to know, like how many renters will be able to become homeowners. Um, we estimated that there are about like uh, 430,000 like, households that are still renting in the Minneapolis San Paul metro area. And they spend about like $1,100 like on average for the rent. What actually drew my attention was that even though renters are older, they're about like 42 years old, older than recent buy years, renters earn only like $44,000, like less than $45,000. However, according to the data, people like need to, to have an income of about like above like $100,000, $105,000 if they want to become homeowners in this area. Specifically, we see that only 12% of the renters have that income. <clears throat> and the main reason for renters like low income is because most of them like have lower than a bachelor like degrees about like the education. And as we know, like income usually increases with education like attainment. Like moreover, uh, uh, when we have like, um, uh, when uh, you have like uh, higher education, uh, your income is expected to be higher as well. And as we mentioned, something else that uh, we also see in the data is about, uh, and I mentioned before, that marriage uh, usually um, uh, coincides when, when like uh, households uh, decide to um, to become like homeowners. And because they want to raise like the kids in a safe and sta stable environment. And um, we see, um, also that married households typically have higher household um, incomes and more financial like assets, which strengthens like the underwriting criteria. However, what we see is that only 18% of these renters are married compared to about like 55% of the home buyer, which is like the share of the home buyers. So less than 20% of these renters are married can be one like of the reasons that it's a little bit like, um, uh, more difficult for them to become like home buyers. Thus, rising mortgage rates uh, may uh, may make it like even harder for these rents like to become like homeowners because rising rents or uh, and rising rents. Uh, what we see is that rents are rising as well, and these rising rents make them like uh, uh, less able uh, uh, to uh, to save for down payment. Um, finally. Um, Let's take a look at the construction, like while, uh, because this is what we also want to see. They're like more, because we explained that there is like uh, a house <laughs> shortage, so we need like to have like more uh, homes available in the market. While this area, what we see is that while this area was building um, more homes in the previous months uh, of the year, like from March until you can see here in the bars, like the blue bars are the single family homes while the red um, bars are the multifamily like with five and plus like units. And what we see is that during like March and uh, June, uh, we see that more homes, uh, more, uh, more, we had like more building permits to be issued, but we see that in July permits fell to about like uh, to six, uh, 690 like single family homes, like uh, less than 700 single family homes. And this is actually, when we compare with the previous like two years, we see that um, uh, in three years, we see that this is a lower level than a year ago and, uh, and uh, lower than uh, like pre-pandemic, like back in July, 2019, when we, it was like about 940 um, single family permits were issued then. However, multifamily construction is still strong, uh, stronger than pre-pandemic, uh, even though it also slowed down like in July. So we should expect like more uh, multifamily homes to come to the market, but not as many like single family uh, homes uh, to, to be available there. Uh, so this is in a nutshell, like the, the trends that we see like in the, the area. Um, uh, I will be very happy uh, if you have any questions to answer these. I cannot hear you very well. 
What do you forecast for 2023 as far as the housing market goes here in the Twin Cities area? Is it going to stay kind of like what we did in 2022 or is it going to go up, down? So we, for more, for home prices, we, we expect to to be very uh, close, like to one uh, percent, like uh, home, like the, the value, like to to come down, like to be like more to normal, like close to uh, one three percent uh, for twenty twenty three. For home sales, uh, we don't uh, we don't expect to have like a, a drop, a decline, to be like almost like flat for the twenty twenty three, the home sales activity. Uh, uh, question: How are you forecasting for unemployment? Unemployment uh, is at all time lows right now. And the Fed continues to raise the Fed funds rate. That's going to create demand destruction. How does that factor into your analysis? For the construction, I, I, I can hardly hear you. Uh, oh, hold on. You, bring, yeah, I think you could, you're far from the microphone. Sorry. I'm going to bring the microphone back there to him. So just one moment. Is it better if I speak in the microphone? Can you hear that better, Nadia? Uh, again, it's not very good, but mm -hmm. I will try. <laughs> so for construction, what we expect? No, uh, my question was, can you hear me better now? Yeah, much better. <laughs> okay, great. My question was, how are you factoring, two questions actually, mm -hmm. how are you factoring and um, the Fed funds rate continuing to go up which is going to create, which they have to create demand destruction in order to get inflation down. How are you factoring in unemployment to your analysis in the event it raises to five, six, seven percent, which they believe it has to get to in order to stop inflation? And then, secondly, with the doubling in interest rates, um, how are you factoring in that 90% of the people have purchased mortgages recently that are under the current interest rate? And how is that doubling in the interest rate and continued increase going to affect demand destruction as well? Sure. Yeah. So for unemployment rate, so uh, first of all, because there are multiple questions. So uh, we, uh, we of course we have like uh, the the continue like increase in the interest rate we expect to have like um everything depends like how it will affect like the job market so this is one of the uh, the the areas that we take a look and what we expect still the market shows that it's still strong to accept these uh, rate hikes uh, like uh, uh, employment is still like strong what we see unemployment is still like below like Four percent, and what we expect for unemployment, it's about like to be about three point seven percent in twenty twenty two, and in twenty twenty three to be about three point nine percent, to be like a little bit like higher than it's like um, for uh, like compared to two thousand twenty two and two thousand twenty three. We expect like in twenty twenty three unemployment rate to be like uh, to be a little bit like higher. So this can uh, like this. Um, Continue like rate hikes will affect the households and the businesses, of course, uh, creating like uh, increasing like the unemployment rate like uh, like for 2023. Uh, then remind me for the second part. Uh, uh, it was the uh, second question. Uh, the other part of that was. Uh, if 90% of the people have purchased mortgages under 6% or under yeah. 5%, so moving, they, for, moving yeah. forward, how is that going to affect the uh, purchasability uh, coupled with the affordability you alluded to? Yeah, so we, we, and this is what we see, like whoever had refinanced, for example, or they purchased like a, a home like with the low mortgage rates, we don't expect mortgage rates to go back to the 3% again, or like below 3%. So this may affect uh, people like to stay longer in their homes or uh, refinance activity to be like slower. And this is what we see, like the uh, people have like less incentives, like to, uh, if they already uh, refinance before, like during the pandemic with the low mortgage rates, they're not gonna be able to refinance again. And of course, for these people who already purchase like a home with less than 6%, this will affect 
of course, like their uh, their decision to, their decision to move. So we may see a longer like stay in effect for the homeowners. However, as you can see, like for first time home buyers, what we see is that, uh, and we also see the trend with the arm, like the uh, the adjustable rate, like mortgages. So some of them, there is an increasing like uh, number of borrowers since like now like uh, mortgage rates are increasing, so they decided to take like a, a seven or a five year arm since they were able to have like a lower rate than the thirty year fixed mortgage. So this usually for these uh, buyers. Uh, it makes sense to take like an arm when you, you plan to move. So this is something else we have to have in mind as well. Like these people uh, may like move in the last like five or seven years. So this can like uh, offset whoever is gonna stay like longer. So we have to have this in mind as well, I think. Thank you for that answer. Does anybody have any other question that's here with us? Nadia, I'm not seeing any other questions. We appreciate your time so incredibly much. I didn't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Yes, uh, Jenny's saying thank you for sharing all this information. It's very informative. So we appreciate you so much. And I can send you the uh, PDF, the, the, uh, the presentation if you wanna share it. I would appreciate that slide deck. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, thanks again. Thank you, thank you all, bye-bye. Bye-bye.